Hi everyone, my name is Stanen and I'm a librarian at the Nanaimo Wellington branch of the Vancouver Island Regional Library. Hello everyone, my name is Narielle Davis and I'm a librarian at the Cowichan branch of the Vancouver Island Regional Library. Uh, we'd like to start by acknowledging the territorial treaties of the Indigenous people of each of the communities in our service area and represented by those in attendance at today's virtual program. I am currently on the land of the Cowichan people tribe whose relationship with the land continues to this day. And I am fortunate and grateful to live, work and raise my family on the traditional territory of the Snunemo First Nation whose relationship with the land also continues to this day. So today we're going to be speaking with Jordan Stratford, author of the Wollstonecraft Detective Agency series, which includes our August Our Shared Shelf book club selection the case of the missing moonstone. In his own words, Jordan Stratford, and I quote, has been pronounced clinically dead, was briefly and mistakenly wanted by Interpol for international industrial espionage, has won numerous sword fights, jaywalked the streets of Paris, San Francisco, and Sao Paulo, was once shot by a stray rubber bullet in a London riot, and lives in a crumbling colonial capital of a windswept Pacific island populated predominantly by octogenarians and carnivorous gulls. Hmm, wonder where that might be. If you haven't had a chance to read The Case of the Missing Moonstone, Moonstone or any of the other Wollstonecraft Detective Agency series books yet, the audiobooks are always available with no wait list on your Vancouver Island Regional Library subscription to RB Digital. If you're watching this live, please add any questions that you would like answered to the comment section of this video on the Vancouver Island Regional Library Plus Fans Facebook page. Our colleague, Natalie Jones, will be moderating the questions and she'll share them with us as we go along. While we may not be able to answer all of your questions today, we'll do, your, do our best to get through as many as possible. And we will also be sharing a recording of this conversation afterwards for those of, who were unable to attend the live session. Hello. Jordan, how are you today? Hello, I'm well. Um, I also want to, st to step in because here I am in Victoria, which is the traditional territory of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation and the Lekongun speaking people. Wonderful. So our first question for you today was we wanted to ask why it was important to you to write a, a story specifically dealing with gender inequality and particularly in a historical context for kids. The, the original hook, I just thought was cool. Honestly, it was just, it, it came out that when, uh, you, as, as a writer, as a lifelong writer, you, like since I was four, I've been, been putting stories into my head. And you collect these weird little things and your whole, uh, you know, everybody has that drawer in your kitchen where like, here's where the, there is an old bread tie and then there's a rubber band and maybe a dead battery or a, a almost dead battery you're holding on to just in case. Yeah. My brain is kind of like that. So I just sort of collect all this stuff. And, and one day in opening the drawer, it rattled together that Ada Lovelace, who was the world's first computer programmer and Mary Shelley, who was the first science fiction author actually had this connection. So, um, I, I started digging down. So obviously, uh, Mary Shelley uh, was married to um, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, and Percy Bysshe Shelley was best friend with Lord Byron, the madman poet, and Byron's daughter happened to be Ada. So there was this kind of like, these guys hung around and how far apart, and is there some way I could connect them? Could I get them to know each other? And they're, in real life, they were 18 years apart in age. And um, I, as well as there's the whole issue of uh, Mary's half sister uh, is actually uh, in, connected romantically to Ada's dad. So I had to like mush up the, it was pretty strange. Um, so I had to uh, kind of take a, a hammer to the timeline and so, okay, what if instead of making this 18 years apart, what if I just move them, you know, uh, 14 years apart so that the girls are incomparable in age? And so 99% of the timeline is integral, it's intact, but it's Ada's timeline. And it's only we change the story a little bit when we have um, Jane or Mary or Peebs. 
entering into the picture. So it's like they're in their little bubble and then everybody else is in this kind of main, mainstream timeline. Um, so I only had to fiddle with the time just a, a little tiny bit, but it was enough. Um, and the other thing is that when I, I started writing this, my daughter was nine and I could really see the shift um, between, you know, one thing that there's this kind of marvelous, uh, constantly inventive girl energy when they're around nine, 10. And, uh, and it's kind of magic to watch actually uh, for, to see anybody speak that fast is kind of amazing. There's definitely a buzz that comes from that. Um, but just this really big hearted sense of you know, what, what popularly is known as girl power, just the idea of the confidence, the, the responsibility, the, the, the reflex to be kind, to want to make the world a better place, to innovate, to be fearless. Um, and I don't want that uh, ferocity to ever be diminished. And, and we know that it does, particularly in terms of science, tech, engineering, math, that we see a lot of girls at you know, nine or 10 thinking of themselves as scientists. Uh, and at 14, that number really drops dramatically. Mm -hmm. So this kind of comes to my big agenda is that the world needs some help right now. We have problems to solve and we are not going to solve the problems that we have if we only invite half the brains in the world to the table. So we need all hands on deck. We need all the ideas uh, that particularly come from that kind of effervescent, fearless nine-year-old girl brain. And it's like, okay, how can we use that to tackle the climate crisis. You know, that is really interesting to me. And I believe that that's really the key. That's fantastic. What does your daughter think of the series? Well, she was an early reader. She was a, my early to test reader. I would hand her a chapter uh, and I, I would get her to read, uh, to read the chapter aloud back to me to see how she handled the vocabulary, how she could look for context clues, how realistic that she felt things were. Um, and so she did that for the first book and midway through the second book, she got bored. So I drafted all of her friends, uh, <laughs> to do it. It's like, okay, you can come over and I'll order a pizza, but everybody has to earn, and, you know, pizza and, and chauffeuring when you're taking, um, you know, 900 kids in a car between dance practice and soccer practice and school. Um, and you know, the car is kind of vibrating with that excitement. It's like, you could use this to actually power solutions to the world. So that was my, that's my yeah. evil plan. I, I think it's a little less than evil, depending on how you use the energy. Well, okay. You know, maybe I build some kind of death ray on the moon, hold the planet hostage, make a few billion dollars, but it'll all go to charity. Like it all, <laughs> you know, it'll all go to puppies and, and pandas and stuff. I'll be, a, I'll be a good super villain. There you go. We always, we always see more uh, goodness in the world. So, hey. <laughs> Um, tied to that question, what inspired you to write specifically about Ada Lovelace and Mary Shelley and not other historical characters? Were there people in history that you wanted to write about but couldn't fit into the book? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, there are, you, you can only bend the timeline so far. Um, it's interesting that uh, Mary Wollstonecraft herself doesn't appear in the book because she's dead by by page one, you know, tragically, she died giving birth to, to Mary. Um, but she's such a fascinating character. She was a war correspondent, she was a philosopher, she was a politician, she was a revolutionary. Uh, she was really the first person in the English language to come up with this crazy idea that if we take boys and girls and we educate them to the same level, that everyone will be able to do something with the stuff that they learn. Um, this is called feminism, <laughs> that everybody has a brain and can do stuff to, to change the shape of their brain and then do something with that changed shape. Um, and again, it's that sense of everybody at the table uh, exercising their education. And this was such a phenomenally scary and intimidating uh, idea to the boring old guys who ran the world at the time that they called Mary a hyena in petticoats, which I always thought was such a hilarious visual. Um, in my head, it's more of a tutu kind of a deal, 
but you know, like a hyena in petticoats, like what a great, what a great insult. So she was this extraordinary uh, and adventurous genius. She, she was covered the French Revolution. Bullets were whizzing over her head while she's fiercely spreading down her notebook. Um, she kicked butt and I would love to do a thing about her. But she couldn't fit in this series. A lot of people, when they start talking about um, 19th century female scientists, will bring up Mary Curie. And she's just way too late. She's just like, at the end of the century, I'm here in the beginning of the century. And you know, it's, 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 you know, uh, uh, Mary Curie's grandmother hasn't been born yet. So she, she couldn't fit. But um, if there was definitely some kind of time traveling adventure, uh, I think that a young Marie Curie would be would be great. Um, uh, there are there are certainly more characters that are contemporaries to Ada and Mary who do fit in the rest of the series, but I won't uh, I won't spoil those quite yet. But um, you know we have Mary Anning, um, who is the founder of, of modern paleontology. We have Mary Somerville who was quite possibly the smartest human who ever lived. Um, and uh, she was the first woman to be admitted to the Royal Society. Um, before Mary Somerville, if you hung out and you were inter into science, they called you a man of science because only men were doing this. Mary Somerville comes along and she blows their heads off because she's so smart and they want to put her in the club, but they can't call her a man of scientist, man of science. So they come up with a new word, scientist, just so she could join. And they're like, we're no longer men of science, we're scientists. And uh, yeah, she made that happen. I mean, that's, that's a, that is a, a glass ceiling to hammer through. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there are, uh, and of course, I keep the young Queen Victoria herself, who was so instrumental in uh, in changes and, and being so forward looking and trying to modernize the country um, and embracing science, embracing technology, um, and certainly uh, you know, doing things like the prisons were were abysmal and needed uh, there needed to be prison reform. Um, at Adrian Mary's time, a prison was pretty much like a med medieval dungeon. Nobody had um, really done much to um, uh, to change the the shape of of the world with for people who were incarcerated um, uh, until Victoria came along, and um, and she was the patron. She had the money. She had the the connections, and so she was just this extraordinary world changing woman. Um, and so you know, I have her in book four as a nine year old. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, so I, I just got to hang out with all these really interesting people. Yeah, and it sounds like maybe time travel when you run out of people to... Eventually, you can just, you know, <laughs> but there are so many awesome 19th century female scientists and we don't hear about them a lot, largely because they were women and it wasn't, um, it wasn't to their benefit. It didn't help them to be known for being famous. Like there was no, there was very little upside to it. Um, and plus there were a lot of men who were taking the credit for the stuff that they were doing. And um, that we see that in the 20th century in the 1950s with Rosalind Franklin, um, we're seeing it today. So that one is kind of evergreen, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but it, um, you know, when you have a friction like that or anything that's unfair, um, this is terrible for the world. It is great for people who want to get excited about something to fix something. And it is awesome for storytellers because um, you, there, there's always got to be something wrong with a story. There's always, you know, what's the problem to be solved. And when that really stings like just complete total unfairness, uh, that's a great place to start from. That's yeah. Definitely, definitely makes uh, for some pretty exciting books that you've written for kids. Um, and speaking of bringing everyone to the table, um, one thing that I really liked about your books is that Ada is really brilliant at making intellectual connections, but she struggles with noticing and understanding the feelings of the people around her. And that's something that Mary really coaches her through, um, just as Ada coaches Mary with understanding some logical situations. So how important was it for you to include this kind of neurodiverse experience uh, like Ada's um, and as well as that aspect of the girl's relationship in your writing? 
it was um, was vital to me as I was reading early uh, accounts of of Ada and from childhood, and it was obvious to me that um, that today we would put her somewhere on the spectrum. Uh, and but that ability to to focus gave her the intellectual rigor, gave her the discipline to do what she ultimately did. And um, she found ways of, you know, while she certainly hated the expectations of society because her mother was a lady and a baroness and her father was a lord. And so she had to have the pretty dress and go to the party and sit there and be pretty and dull and talk about all the boring things and, you know, come home and, and embroider. Um, that she wasn't interested in any of that. Um, but eventually she realized, uh, because she became fascinated with, with math and with rules, and then ultimately with games, particularly card games, and uh, then realized that all of this performance about society and expectations was itself a game. It was a system. And if it's a system, it can be hacked. And so she brought her hacker's mentality to navigating other people's, so more neurotypical people's um, expectations of her, how they handled information. And she learned how to play that game and, and, um, and had the, the mastery of it. So she ended up becoming this kind of party girl socialite for a while because it was, and it was an all an act, but it was, she was just, she figured out the rules of the game. Um, but I also wanted to talk about how it, it became a great launching off point for story in that uh, real scientific advancement always requires imagination. It always requires some kind of dream or spark or something that's completely extraordinary. Because if you just kind of keep compiling the math, you get to a predictable conclusion. If you want to go to an extraordinary conclusion, you need these kind of leaps of intuition. You need leaps of, of imagination. And uh, Mary definitely provided that with Frankenstein because science scientists at the time were suddenly wondering, hey, is this possible? Do we have a, a hypothesis here that we can test? Can we prove or disprove this and to what degree? So she really set a fire under their butts and that was pretty cool. Um, and so you know, not only does this push science forward, but it also helps in story when you have two girls who see the world in a very specific way, but in a very different way. The only way to get a complete picture is when they learn to rely on and trust each other's perspectives. And even as the series progresses, Ada stops and goes, okay, hang on. I don't have Mary, I don't have Mary here right now, but how would Mary untangle this situation? Right now, I'm not, not getting the answers that I want. I'm running into a brick wall. So Mary, Mary's good with people, what would she do? And when uh, Mary's looking through mounds and mounds of evidence and just raw data, and, she, and it's just everywhere, and she can't make sense of it. She stops and she says, okay, well, how would Ada tackle this problem? Is there a system? Is there some way we can start organizing these spatially, chronologically? You know, how can I just start to kind of filter through all of this, this story stuff? And, uh, and at the end she, of that process, she has Charles, and they play a little game together, a little storytelling game based on the evidence and that builds it together. But Mary wouldn't have been able to do that if she hadn't learned those skills from Ada. So it, it really is how these, these two different girls interact, support, and you know, genuinely care for each other, but they start to shape each other's personalities and, and the, the type of curiosity that they have. They have an amazing friendship. Is there any way that this is, is this based at all on any friendships that you've had, any relationships of your own in the past? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that there's something uh, extraordinary about friendships that you have at that, that, uh, uh, at that tween age where you have these just intense loyalties and, uh, and it's really loving. And it's just in a, in a very, you know, we have all these, um, we have too few words for, for love, but it is a definitely a kind of a fierce love that you have for your friends. Um, it's platonic love, it's fraternal love. Um, and, uh, you know, you really do create that sense of, of clan or family 
around your friends and you have to rely on them because the world is sometimes just too weird uh, to tackle on your own. And you need people as weird as you are to, uh, to ride out the, the storm sometimes. So um, while it came from my own uh, friendships, mostly it was about the, seeing the friendships that I observed through my daughter and, and her friends. So far, you've written four books in the Wollstonecraft Detective series. Um, how do you envision Ada and Mary's lives going forward? So I planned the first five books out as almost like a season of television, right? That there's an arc and we can see where the arc is going by the end of book four. There's a big reveal. <laughs> um, and after the reveal, you always need to have a showdown. So there's the showdown model. Uh, Random House hasn't picked that up. So, uh, and I honestly haven't finished it, um, but that will come out. I did write a spinoff adventure with, uh, with Charles Dickens where um, he is out and so because he's a, a little older, he's 14 approaching 15, uh, what he was doing at that time is he was working as a law clerk and that meant being a courier, it meant going between the magistrate and the prison and the, uh, and the morgue. So he's dealing with, with um, things that are more adult, more disturbing, darker. He's actually dealing with, with death as a, as a theme. Um, as well as all kinds of boring things because he's his main job is that he's a human photocopier. He has to write things down. And, um, you know, it gets to be fun when he's like, you know, gets to go and get something countersigned by a client. Uh, and uh, Charles Dickens' best friend when he was a boy, when he was poor and stuck in the boot polish factory that he is in most of the Wolfscraft series, um, his best friend was a boy named Bob Fagan. And Dickens used these, uh, the words of people that he was close to and had gathered all his life that all showed up in his fiction. So when he comes up with an extraordinary name, Pickwick or, or Chuzzlewit, these are names that he actually ran across in, in real life um, and thought that they were funny and, and wrote them down in a notebook. So, um, so I have uh, Boz, which was his, his uh, kind of childhood family nickname, uh, and uh, and Fagin having an adventure trying to solve a series of murders in London, uh, and uh, that, yeah, that one is 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 fun. But it's definitely set in the Wollstonecraft universe, and I wanted to see how far I could push that. <laughs> um, before we get into more questions, I just want I just want to remind viewer people that are watch with us today that if you do have any questions for Jordan Stratford, please put them into the Facebook chat. We will try to make sure we can ask, ask them while he's still with us here at this live interview. Um, we wanted to, I, we noticed that the case of the missing moonstone features a number of ingenious scientific inventions that would have been cutting edge at the time of Mary and Ada's time. How did you go about researching all these historical details and scientific inventions of the time? Well, obviously, that was a lot of fun. It was a big part of the of the adventure um, was to look at um, you know all this cool stuff that was lying around, and the Regency is the area era before the Victorian era. So um, it's sort of the late seventeen hundreds, early eighteen hundreds, um, and uh, there was a king, but the king was kind of bonkers, and they tried to ignore him as much as possible. They kind of put him in a box. Um, and then there was the prince. And then when the prince was like waiting, then the prince wasn't the king yet. And then he became the king and people were like, yeah, but is he really the king? And nobody really cared. And then uh, Victoria came along and things kind of spooled up from there. So we have this kind of the weird meanwhile of about 30 years between the 1790s and 1820s. Um, and it is extremely rich. Oops, sorry, I'm getting a thing. I don't know if you can still see me. Not yet. Hopefully you can. Nope, we can hear you. Uh, we can okay. hear you, but we can't see you. You can hear me. Okay, I don't know if you, I don't know how to, you can re-see me. Okay, there's a button. Ah, there. And we there have are. There we go. Okay, sorry. So, yeah, weird technical glitch. Um, everybody went blank for a sec. 
So the, um, uh, the, the Regency period uh, was interesting from an invention and a mad science perspective because all this stuff had been invented, right? We, we have uh, aviations, so we have hot air balloons, we have the telegraph, we have railroads, we have torpedoes, we have electromagnets, um, but what scientists did to fund their inventions was basically turn all the science into entertainment. So you had to go to somebody's wealthy house party. And also in those days that wealthy people would have a, a party and that party would last for four to six weeks. Which really you would like go, go move into somebody's house and you would have dinner every night. And you, so you had to have a whole thing, you put on a play together, you would do a big thing and then there'd be fireworks you kick the whole thing off, but it would take weeks and weeks where, you know, you might do a little hunting, some camping, some fishing, um, you know, art class. It was kind of like running off to camp. And so scientists who wanted to survive at the time would actually kind of uh, loan themselves out or rent themselves out to these parties saying, if you, I'll go here and I will put on these shows of my scientific marvels and we'll all do experiments together. And, and that was really about it. So this stuff existed in labs, but you couldn't go out and buy it. You couldn't necessarily, you know, there were some, some railroads on private properties that would, would go like two, two kilometers and stop. Um, people were afraid of going faster than 13 miles an hour or 50 kilometers an hour because they thought that the human body couldn't stand those kind of forces and would explode. So, yeah. So don't go faster than 50K or you'll explode. Turns out they were wrong, but they were really worried about that at the time. Um, and they would do things like put put sheep on trains and make the sheep go and the train go faster. And then the sheep didn't explode. It's like, oh, okay, maybe it's safe. So um, I mean, the sheep were just like, woohoo! <laughs> so you know, if you're a sheep getting on a train for the first time, it's probably pretty exciting. So. Um, uh, that was, was a large part of the appeal was that there was all this stuff, but it wasn't around. Um, it had been invented, but it wasn't widely available. So it definitely belonged into the idea of what it could be rather than what it was. And that's a really interesting thing from a storytelling standpoint. It's about potential. You know, that's the lightning in the bottle. What happens if I let this genie out? Um, you know, then it can be anything. But there's this moment of tension when it's like, we have these inventions, but we're not sure what to do with them. And, um, uh, and we're not sure if these could be used for, for nefarious purposes. Uh, so yeah, so it was a fun hook to play with. Yeah. I mean, aside from having six week long invention parties, which uh, is not gonna be happening these days. Do you have any recommendations for kids at home that are wanting to have their own scientific adventures right now? I mean, absolutely. There's so much you can do uh, scientifically. And right now we are all observing this big scientific phenomena and you can start to learn about epidemiology and virology and all the numbers and, uh, and then who controls the, what those numbers get to say. Certainly, um, you know, we have had we had issues relatively recently in Canada where Canadian climate scientists weren't allowed to publish their findings because the government didn't want them to. This would be very frustrating to be a scientist. Um, health officials in the United States right now at the Center for Disease Control are not allowed to publish their research because the government doesn't want them to. Uh, that's a thing that happens sometimes. Um, and so that relies on journalists and other ways to get the, get the word out and get the information out. Um, and uh, it's a really interesting way to learn about how science and culture mix. So by just by paying attention to that is pretty cool. But obviously, you know, your kitchen is a great place to start for, uh, for household chemistry. And, you know, just you know, one of the, the best inventions in the world is the mop. Because if you are doing household inventions in your kitchen, you are going to make a mess. And then you can get a mop 
and then the mess goes away. Like, it's fine. It's okay if you're covered in baking soda because your baking soda vinegar volcano blew up um, and it's made a huge mess. And all you have to do is get the mop and it's not a problem anymore. So um, yeah, just go and make mistakes and uh, you know, get, get some supervision, make sure some things aren't going to uh, create any kind of noxious gases or anything. Um, but there are a lot of things that, uh, that you can experiment with, even just with, uh, you know, with an ice cube tray and a clock, you know, hot water freezes faster than cold water. Why, why does it do that? What is it about the hot water that crystallizes? Cause that's really what ice is. Why does it get to that tipping point of crystallizing faster than cold water? Obviously the hot water has to turn into cold water first, but what's going on in there? So maybe that's not true. Maybe I'm wrong. So wait, is, is figure out an experiment to test whether that's true or not. And let me know what you come up with. <laughs> um, and then, then look, look up why. So yeah, there's all kinds of ways to, uh, to really stay in your head and use your imagination. Uh, but you, can it's it's still summer you're you can go outside and observe the natural world and you can draw a plant and you can try to raise a tomato and just see what happens and maybe take a picture picture of it on your phone every day that may create some kind of record so yeah there's lots of ways to just all, all science is just paying attention to what's going on and asking questions about it and saying i wonder what happens if i do this um and often what happens when I do this involves a mop. So, you know, you just get good at mopping. All scientists are, good at, are all good at mopping. Well, that's, that's great. Um, in terms of keeping a, a picture or a, an image record of things, mm -hmm. we've been doing audiobook August, but we've been working hard to uh, post images from the physical book on our Facebook page because the, there are some beautiful illustrations that have been included in this book. Um, how did you choose come to choose Kelly Murphy to draw the characters and how does her art contribute to your storytelling? Well, as, as the mere author, I don't get to choose who um, the illustrator is. Um, uh, that was done by my editor. And um, but I saw stuff that uh, Kelly had done for uh, uh, some Jane Austen novels and um, thought that she had completely nailed it in terms of, of the aesthetic. So, um, and, I, and I got to see most of the illustrations before they went to press, but not all of them. So sometimes I'll be opening a book and seeing an illustration for the first time. Um, and it certainly does, um, you know, like there are, are, are just a weird little things. I didn't really describe the layout of the, of the foyer, like the, 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 the entrance hall of the Marleybone house about which was where and how, and yet, um, and Kelly and I never talked about it, but she drew what was in my head anyway. Like she just got it. Like everything was exactly where it was supposed to be. So, um, the, uh, you were just obviously we we're in sync, and yeah, her her visual contribution um, is enormous, and just getting that sense of um, oh, just rounding out the scene and really making you feel like you're there. One of my favorites in in Missing Moonstone is when the girls are in prison, and they're down the hallway, and there's just a curious little rat in the corner, like, hey, what's going on? Um, and it's kind of spooky because, you know, it's a rat, but it's, um, the rat is also kind of harmless and just staying out of their way and just really curious as to what the girls are doing. Um, and it's obvious that the girls aren't sure what they're doing, but they are running an experiment to see if something is going to happen. Um, and it pays off that something does happen so they get the information that they want. So, um, the, uh, uh, it's, it's, it certainly is easier as you go book by book when you've got those illustrations that help build out the world. And you know, as I imagined book four, 
having seen the illustrations of books one, two, and three, yeah, absolutely. I wanted to, I could see where the, the opportunities were for illustration, even though I never had to spell those out. I don't, it's not a call that I get to make. Um, but the editor knows me pretty well at that point. And Kelly knows the stories pretty well. So she just knows what to draw. And I just, I get to stay out of the way and, and appreciate her contribution. One amazing. Um, so little, possibly little known facts about you is that you've been involved in the local steampunk community, including, as I understand, co-founding the Victoria Steam Expo. How has this interest of yours impacted your creative writing, would you say? Um, I started steampunk pretty early in, um, in its arrival as, a, as an art form. Um, and I just thought that it was, was interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm in, uh, I'm in the steampunk Bible uh, and there's a documentary called Vintage Tomorrows. Uh, and, and I'm in that and you know, what I really liked about it is and one of my favorite things that in the universe, I think my iPad is amazing. Uh, here's just this black mirror, this black sheet of glass, but I can talk to it. Um, I can draw on it. Uh, I can write a book on it. Uh, I can watch a movie on it. And um, it is limitless, but it's just this thin little pane of glass. But um, I don't know how it works. I mean, yes, technically I know how it works, but it's not obvious how it works. There's no, it's, it's not evident. Um, whereas I can take a toaster apart with a screwdriver and I can actually see, okay, electricity comes here, this thing gets hot, this is the spring, this is the box, this is when it knows that it's done. And then that releases this mechanism and then ta -da, toast. Where does the bread go? That's the only thing I've been able to figure out. <laughs> I know that bread goes in and the toast comes out but where does this bread go? I don't know. So um, that one I can't figure out, but you know, I'm getting close. More experimentation needed. So, um, uh, but we have all of these things that we can actually you know, take a wrench to and, and get a sense of how these things are connected and how they work um, and how you can fix them. And there's something marvelous about the 19th century that gave us the, you know, that led to all this stuff that we have. Um, but now we don't, we just have control surfaces. We have, you know, like nobody, nobody paints their TV. Nobody would think about painting their TV. Um, but why not? If you want to paint TV, then just paint your TV pink. Like, why not? Um, and, you know, I, people will put a sticker on their laptop, but, you know, they wouldn't actually paint it. I think that's, that's interesting about how we just own and interact and decorate the stuff that is around us. And I like the physicality of steampunk. Mm -hmm. uh, so it certainly helped with, uh, by promoting these shows and promoting these little art shows and these kind of little fairs uh, around steampunk. I, I managed to spotlight a number of artists who were doing extraordinary things. Uh, and I just wanted people to pay attention to them because they were cool. And, uh, but I built this network of really successful uh, engaged steampunk artists so that years later when I did this steampunk, slightly steampunk around the edges, even though it was a little early, most steampunk takes place sort of at the end of the 1800s or I was in the beginning of the 1800s. Um, and there's a, a category called clock punk, which is kind of on the border. So I kind of skirted the border of, of these two things. Um, but when I said, hey, I'm gonna do this, I had this built-in audience of artists that I promoted, who in turn promoted me, uh, who helped bring that project together. So it was absolutely, by, um, by bringing cool people together, letting them do cool stuff, by celebrating the cool stuff that they were doing, when I was ready to do something cool, those people stepped in to help me. And that was, that's a huge part of it. That's awesome. And in terms of helping people, what tips do you have for kids interested in writing their own detective stories? Okay, well, um, if, I mean, I've been writing forever. Um, I wrote my first uh, book when I was four. It was pretty short, admittedly, and it was mostly a picture, but there was some writing. Um, and uh, 
so I've always had stories and I've always been really excited about the process of getting the story down. Um, the, the biggest trick is figuring out what kind of writer you are. So it's more important than the story, more important than your characters. The most important thing is, is what kind of, of writer you are. And writers tend to fall into two categories. We have plotters and we have pantsers. And a plotter, I'm a plotter. Um, I know what I'm going to write before I write it. I have it all worked out. I spend days or months or sometimes years wandering around thinking about every character, what they want, how I'm not going to give it to them. I'm a big me to all my characters. But you know, you, a, a book has a beginning and a middle and an end. And that means that it has the beginning of the beginning, the middle of the beginning, the end of the beginning, the beginning of the middle, the middle of the middle, the end of the middle, the beginning of the end, the middle of the end, and the end of the end, right? So you create a map as to what happens in all of these things. And then you just spend some time coloring in between the lines, right? And so um, I figure out what's gonna happen, how it's gonna happen, what it's gonna mean, and then I just populate those scenes. I put stuff in those boxes. That's a plotter. A pantser is someone who writes by the seat of their pants. They are just winging it. It's like, I think I got a character, let's just see what happens and they just go. And that is great um, for just freestyling, it's great for your imagination. It is really hard to finish anything when you, when you don't know what happens next. Um, and you give a lot of room for your characters to breathe and grow, but um, they will we'll often sort of turn to you and then say, well, now what do you want me to do? So that can be a challenge. Um, but I have friends who are pantsers and they are very effective at it and they finish books. Um, they're amazing. They don't know how I can be a plotter. They just do not know how that works. So we have two very different brains and you know, the beauty of, of, of art or science um, or even just going to school with somebody is that you're exposed to different kinds of brains. Different kinds of brains work differently. And that doesn't mean this one is bad or this one is good. It just means that they're different and there's different ways of solving different kinds of problems. I think that's awesome. That's really interesting for me that people have this whole kind of squishy pink thing in their head that does not work the same way that my squishy pink thing does. That's neat. Um, so the most important thing first off is figure out what kind of a writer you are at the moment because that can change you can develop other skills um, as you grow most people um uh when you're a kid you're you don't necessarily have a plan and you just kind of you've got an idea and you just start going um so you feels like you're a pantser most of us get practice as being pantsers first but you rarely need to actually deliver something and finish it in which case you can start getting some plotting skills and find between those two ends, between plotting and pantsing, you can find the, the, the mix that works for you and your brain. And if it works for you and your brain, that's all that matters because you only get your brain. You don't get anybody else's brain. So figure out how your brain works and, and make it happy. Um, and then, you know, a, a mystery specifically is a thing happened and it happened to a person, by a person, in a space, for a reason, and then you work backwards from there. So you start with the solution, what actually happened. Not, what's, not what it looked like when it happened, but what actually happened. And then just try to make it stranger from there, but with clues so that it all comes down to a, aha. And in most mysteries come down to things are not what they seem. So someone is not who they say they are. Um, a thing is not in place it should be. Um, and, uh, and, and relationships are not the way that you've been led to believe. So, you know, maybe you find out that your sister is really your cousin. Um, you know, like, wow, what would that do to your own head as a kid um, in your family? It's something that you take, take for granted forever. Um, it would be almost be like finding out that your cat was secretly a dog the whole time. I mean, you know, there's it it cool stuff. Um, but there's lots of room also to throw in just like crazy random 
silly things. A mystery sometimes um, can just have a, a hook. Like what if you came home and you found an alpaca in your bathtub? Um, that's a mystery. That is for most people a mystery, unless you are, you know, a professional alpaca groomer. That would be a regular Tuesday at the office. But mm -hmm. for most of us, if you came home and you found alpaca in your bathtub, you'd want to know what the heck is going on? Why is there an alpaca in the bathtub? How did the alpaca get to the bathtub? What does this mean in the broader, like, is it going to stay in there? What do I do about it? Where does the alpaca want to be? Is the alpaca having a good time? Um, is the alpaca lost? Whose alpaca is it? Is it your alpaca now? Do you have to bathe it every day? Like, what does all this mean? So you can find some really funny, silly hook and just keep asking a ton of questions about it. And that's really what a mystery is. Well, I think you've given all our young writers a great uh, first prompt there to get going on there. Yes, excellent. <laughs> Practice their skills. That's awesome. Um, now we've heard rumors that this might be turned, this Wollstonecraft Detective Agency series might be turned into a television series. Do you have any news on that? Uh, no news. I've had several over the years. Um, you, there's a, a thing called an option where a studio comes and says, hey, we'd really like to make this into a TV series. Um, and we will give you absolutely no money, but we promise to spend lots of money on lawyers and um, uh, I will draw some pictures and hopefully that this will be cool. And then a year goes by and you say, what happened? He said, oh, well, our lawyers talked to other lawyers and we've decided not to do something, but their lawyers want to talk to you because they have an idea. And then another studio comes and says, okay, we couldn't make that work, but maybe we can make another thing work. Um, and this goes back and forth. Television and film is predominantly made out of lunch. Lunches have to happen between producers, between agents, between lawyers, and they all have to have lunch. You can't just have a phone call. You can't have a Zoom meeting. There has to be lunch. And the lunch can only happen in like three places on earth. The lunch has to happen in New York. So the lunch has to happen in Los Angeles or the lunch has to happen in London. And some, and there's 27 or 28 lunches. And you can get up to lunch number 20 and they're not in the same place. You can't have 27 <laughs> lunches in New York and expect a TV deal to happen. So you have to have like 18 lunches in New York and four lunches in Los Angeles and you know, seven lunches in London. You know, it is something like that. Um, and so I've spent lots of time in the last uh, seven years since the first book came out um, in l lunching in London and Los Angeles and New York, trying to make this happen. Uh, so I have a recent, uh, real soon now announcement to make about the latest round of who I'm having lunch with, which is going to be hard in a COVID world. We'll see how that works. Um, but, uh, more lunches will be happening. The, but one thing that your readers may not know about is that we do have, um, the, the game has been, or sorry, the, the series has been made into a tablet game for iPads and for Android tablets, uh, just at wollstonecraft.com, or you can go to Google Play or the Apple App Store. Um, the first mystery is free, but the idea is that Ada and Mary recruit you. They need your help to crack codes, to program the bleh, which they train you how to do. Um, and so you learn a bit about binary and programming. You learn about critical logic and sleuthing. You have to find hidden objects, solve puzzles, follow suspects, write reports. And while Ada and Mary are interviewing somebody over here that's important, you're getting letters sent to them or sent from them. And while they're asking you to go to somewhere else and look for clues, and maybe it's like, look for anything with a monkey on it. Uh, and sometimes that makes strong sense and to you. And sometimes it's just Ada wanted to look at monkeys because it would remind her about something else that would ultimately lead to the clue because it's just the way her brain works. And we're just going to work around Ada's brain sometimes, um, which you do with your friends, right? You, your friends don't always make sense to you 100% of the time, but sometimes they really need you to do something. And you just do it because you care about them and they're your friend and you know they've got to rely on somebody and that's you. And so we do a lot of things for the people that we care about that we don't always completely understand at the time, but we hope it all works out. Um, 
And science and mystery and friendship is a lot like that. That's awesome. We have uh, one last question for you, but before we do that, I just want to remind everyone that if you do have any questions for our author, please feel free to put those in our Facebook chats and we will be happy to try to fit them in as long as we get them fairly soon before we wrap up. All right, for our last question, what other projects are you working on? Okay, gosh, um, what am I working on right now? Uh, I have, um, since I wrote the, the first four Wollstonecraft books, uh, I made, and I worked on the game for some time. It took a lot, uh, it took a number of years and a lot of work just to do the Wollstonecraft game. And then of course, meeting and production and stuff for the TV series. Um, I wrote a, a really fun, I call it a Pacific North weird story um, about two 12 year old boys who figure out alchemy and they turn lead into gold and then everything goes horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> um, I wrote a, uh, a younger middle grade uh, story that, that feels a lot like uh, Beetlejuice. Um, yeah, there is a, um, uh, so here's the thing. It's based on this, this idea that if you've seen all those shows about ancient Egypt and there's always a mummy and at some point they always like x-ray the mummy. They have to do this on every show they x-ray the mummy, they put the mummy through a CAT scan or an MRI machine, or they just x-ray the mummy. <clears throat> and it is a well-kept secret, but still a secret that millions of people know is that uh, when you x-ray a mummy, they very frequently come back from the dead. So that in every x-ray lab in the world, there is a pair of mummy defense mittens that you put, can put on to protect yourself from the mummy. And there's an 800 number on the package that you call, and then the mummy defense team will show up and we'll deal with the mummy while you stay safe, keeping up the mummy defense mittens. Um, so it's about that. It's about a, a 2200 year old, 12 year old girl who comes back to life uh, in Portland and needs her friends to, um, so she makes some friends and she has to get all of her guts because you know, they put the mummies in different guts or all of her, and the guts in different jars. And she has to get all of her jars together before the uh, moon set for the last of the last new moon goes down. So uh, it's called Moonset. That's really, really fun. Uh, and I'm shopping around that around for television as well. I have a new series called Scry about a 12-year-old settler girl in Victoria who can see ghosts and it, as well as indigenous spirits and is trying to reconcile um, when settlers move here from Ireland or Scotland and they bring with them their family grand ghosts or it's a folklore like hobgoblins uh, and elves and trolls uh, so that she helps people with ghost problems and ghosts with people problems. Um, and so that's a television pilot that I've written and that I'm shopping around. Uh, and there's more, I could just, I have a problem. I have a story problem. I just sort of keep cranking <laughs> this stuff out. So yeah, I'm just putting a whole slate of things together. Um, uh, I love writing games. I love uh, role-playing games. So if you're familiar with something like Dungeons and Dragons, I write uh, games and I write four games that are very similar to D&D. &D. Um, and uh, and I, well, I play every Tuesday night uh, with my friends and we meet online and we roll dice and fight monsters. Uh, and I've been doing that since I was in junior high. So that doesn't go away, even though like I'm a hundred now. So, um, uh, yeah, playing games with your friends is always is always cool. It's always fun. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jordan, and for this author visit. And we want to let everybody know that starting in September, we're going to actually be featuring two new books in our book club. Our Books and Beyond book club, for those who want to explore commu community action topics and activities, will take will feature The Rest of Us Just Live Here by Patrick Ness. Our Take a Break book club for people seeking to escape will feature The Opposite of Everyone by Jocelyn Jackson. And this book club, our shared shelf book club for children and families will feature The Jumbies by Tracy Baptiste. You can find more information about these book clubs on our website, viral.bc.ca. And for this book club, we will be drawing for our shared, shove, shared shelf 
Shared Shelf Book Prize on Thursday, August 27th. So please do check back for an exciting announcement. But I want to say again, thank you, Jordan, for joining us today and for taking the time to share with us a little bit about the writing and the world of Wollstonecraft Detective Agency. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to seeing more from you. <laughs>